Dr. Sturm, and I'm going to give you a basic review of sedimentary rocks. You should have had these in physical geology class. And uh, so I just want to do a quick review so that you can remember some of those details about sedimentary rocks because we're going to be using them a lot in the Earth History class. So the reason we use sedimentary rocks over igneous and metamorphic rocks in the Earth History class is because sedimentary rocks can tell us a number of things. They can tell us the climate of an area. They can tell us whether it was a marine area or whether it was a terrestrial area. They can even tell us the type of animals that lived in that area. So sedimentary rocks can give us a lot of clues as to what the climate and the environment was like at the time those rocks were deposited. So let's first look at the categories of sedimentary rocks. The first group of sedimentary rocks, and I want you also to uh, look at your lab packet. So that lab packet is in your resources section. And you'll see one page has a, a description of the environments of deposition. You will need to memorize this. And then we also have another page that says rocks used in the Geology 112 lab. So these are the only rocks that you need to know for the Geology 112 lab. So the first thing is we group these into different categories. So the first group is clastic sedimentary rocks. And that word clastic just means that it's a particle. The particle can be very large or very, very, very tiny. And those particles are cemented together to form a rock. The next group are biologic or biogenetic uh, rocks. Um, we actually have two groups. One group occurs on land and they're more terrestrial, and the other group is a marine biochemical rock. And then the last group are just purely chemical rocks. These were formed due to evaporation and in an evaporative basin. So we have those groups of rocks. The first group I want to go over are your clastic rocks. And so again, clastic rocks are formed of particles that range from really big, like a boulder is considered a particle, down to really, really tiny clay-sized particles. So at the larger end, um, we actually have two rocks. One is conglomerate and one is breccia or breccia. Uh, there are different pronunciations for that one. And they both have the same size of particles. And so the pebbles that are inside of these are anything two millimeters and bigger. So it can be from two millimeters up to boulder size. So in this case, um, in these two particular samples, these pebbles are around like quarter inch up to two, two and a half inches in size. And they're very similar looking, but what we're looking at is the, the roundness of those pebbles that are contained in those rocks. So breccia has broken angular pebbles. So that means that if you look at the pebbles that are contained in here, you're going to see sharp edges. And that tells us that this rock was deposited really close to the source where those pebbles broke off from the original mountain. They didn't travel very far. They literally just broke off, settled, and formed a rock. So breccias are formed in alluvial fans. And an alluvial fan is a pile of rocks at the base of a mountain. So we have breccias that are formed there. Conglomerates can have the exact same size of pebbles or particles or clasts that are inside the rock. But in this case, these pebbles have traveled. So it tells us that the pebbles are older because they've rolled around and they've traveled. Now typically these pebbles are going to travel in rivers and streams. So they may break off from a mountain, an original source, and gradually work their way to a river or stream, and they're going to be rolled in the stream. And so that rolling rounds out those sharp edges, so they're no longer sharp. The more round a particle is, it tells us it's traveled farther and it's, uh, which has occurred over a longer period of time. So it's had a longer period of time away from the source rock. So conglomerate is rounded pebbles. An easy way to remember that, the word conglomerate contains lots of O's, and those O's of course are rounded. So think of the conglomerate, rounded, and rounded pebbles. So um, conglomerate 
is we look at the environment of deposition for conglomerate and it forms in rivers. So those pebbles will be picked up, carried to a river, and then they usually settle down unless you have really rapid running water because they weigh more. So you have to have really high flood volumes of water to pick them back up and move them again. So they typically form, conglomerates form in rivers and streams. Your next group, we're gonna go down in size on the particles. So the next group is composed of sandstones. So we actually have three types of sandstones that we're gonna be looking at in this class. We have Arcos sandstone, which has a pink coloration. We have lithic sandstone, which is this kind of uh, brownish tan sandstone. And then we have quartz aronite sandstone. If you, um, on a test, you're gonna have to identify these different rocks. And so you have to use the full complete name. If you just put sandstone, I'm gonna take off because that's not the complete name. And it also doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us where it was deposited at. So starting with the Arco sandstone, we know that first of all, all of these sandstones, when you touch them, they are very textural. They feel like sandpaper because they have sand-sized particles. So with sandstone, you should be able to feel the particles in the rock. You can actually touch them and feel the roughness in it. Um, often too, you can visually just see the roughness of the particles. Now in Arco sandstone, it's pink because it contains a lot of feldspars. Feldspars come from mountains. So Arco sandstone actually forms in the same area as the breccia does, but a little bit further away from the mountain. It also forms in alluvial fans. So remember the Arco sandstone, the samples that we use are the pink color because they have a lot of feldspars, and they form in alluvial fans at the base of mountains. The other two, the lithic sandstone and the quartz aronite sandstone, though, they will form underwater. So alluvial fans, which are at the base of mountains, are not underwater, those are above water. The lithic sandstone will form in rivers and streams. It's gonna form alongside the conglomerate. So you'll have this in rivers, streams, even all the way out to the mouth of the river where it meets with the ocean, it can form in deltas also. It has um, a more tan type of color because it's still carrying other minerals from further upstream. You might even have some organics in there. And we compare that to the quartz aronite sandstone, which is light cream to even white in color. Well, the reason it's that color is because this forms along beaches. So on a beach, those particles are reworked over and over and over again. And so a lot of the minerals that originated further inland up towards the mountains, they will be destroyed. They're gonna be completely obliterated and what you're gonna have left is pure quartz. So that quartz typically is a light cream to, to white in color. So quartz aronite sandstone is the lightest in color and it forms in beach areas. So those are your sandstones. I wanna show you an example of an environment of deposition. So hopefully you'll be able to see this. I'm gonna move it back and forth. This is a big slab of sandstone. And I'm not sure if you can see it on the film, but there's actually ripple marks on here. So this actually came from Indiana. And one of our former students brought this in. And these are ripple marks. Ripple marks tell us the environment that it formed in. So obviously it formed in an area where there was water and the water is moving in a particular direction. Now I need a little bit more information, but we know ripple marks can form in rivers, larger rivers, and also they can form along the beaches. If we based it only on color, we would say it would be a lithic sandstone, and so it probably formed in a river. But the other thing to note is that we have some kind of um, kind of an orange color along the edges. Well, what that is, that's called weathering. And whenever rocks of any kind are exposed to, to rain and wind, the rock weathers and it actually picks up other minerals from the rain. And those other minerals will often change the color of a rock. This is why when you want to really identify rocks, 
You want to break a rock open to see what the mineral or the rock is inside that hasn't been weathered. So, but we look at this and we know this is in an area where we have water flowing over it and ripples formed. So our next group of rocks in the clastic category, we're going down in size. The next smallest size is siltstone. So siltstone, siltstone to me is very fine grained, but you, if you rub your hand over it, you can still feel a texture. It almost has a little bit of a velvety texture to it. Um, some people like to lick, and it kind of has a rough texture on your tongue. But this is safe to lick, just like halide is safe to lick. So it has a little bit of a rougher texture. And it's kind of in this massive form. The next one down, and siltstone typically forms um, in river floodplain. So when a river floods, you have the tiny, tiniest particles overflow on the banks, and the siltstone and clay will form in those river floodplains. The next group down in the classic category are your shales. So we have red, red shale, green shale, which is actually kind of a gray color, but it's called green shale. And then we have black shale. So the red shale um, typically forms alongside that siltstone in river floodplains. Um, shale is notable because it forms in flat layers. It forms in flat layers because clay um, composes shale. And clay is a mineral that is flat in shape. So when clay is stacked upon each other, it's going to form almost in sheets. It's going to form in very flat layers. So shale typically, when you break it, it's always going to break in these flat layers. So it's always going to have flat surfaces. It is the smallest particle. So clay is the smallest of the clastic particles. And um, again, it forms in different areas. And on your chart, you can see the different areas. The one we're going to talk about the most is black shale. Black shale can form in two very differing environments. It can form in swampy areas. So in this case, you may have a lot of organics present, but you often have anoxic environments where we have this tannin in the water and there's no oxygen. Well, in that case, you will form black shale in a swampy area. So a swamp, of course, is a terrestrial environment there is water running through it, but it's fresh water, but it's terrestrial. The other place you can have shale is in the very deep, deep part of the ocean. Again, we have an anoxic environment, but in this case, we're in salt water, so it's a marine environment. So keep in mind, the word marine refers to salt water, whereas fresh water refers to any terrestrial area. So black shale can form in either a swamp or can form in the deep marine areas. How would we know the difference? Well, if we're just given black shale and we have no other information, then you write down what form either in a swamp or in the deep marine area. But a lot of times, the black shale will have fossils in it. And those fossils will be plants. Now, typically marine plant plants do not fossilize. I've never seen a fossil with a marine plant. But terrestrial plants, those plants that we find on land, they do fossilize, and that's what you'll find in shale forms in swamps. So if you see the leaf of a fern, or um, could even be a, a leaf from a tree, like an oak tree or maple tree, and it's in black shale, then you know it formed in a swamp. And so, you know, and indicate it's from a swamp, it's a terrestrial environment, it did not form in a deep marine environment. So that's our group of, of clastic rocks. The next group we're going to look at are those which are biologic. There's some component that we have a, a, either they're the remains of organisms or there's a biological component that is part of the rock. So I have these broken up into two areas. One is those rocks that are formed in a marine environment. They're formed under the ocean. Now, because the ocean is so big, on an on answer for a test, you can't just put marine. You have to tell me what part of the ocean that they formed in. So they can form on the beach, 
They could form in shallow marine, they could form all the way out on the continental shelf, or they can form in deep marine. Some of them can form from shallow to deep marine. So you have to be very specific because each one of those areas is going to indicate a completely different environment. So for instance, I've got two of them here that form on the beach. One is called coquina, and the other one is oolitic limestone. So both of these form in beach areas. Coquina is formed from crushed up seashells. And all of the limestones are composed of calcite. So if you ever wanted to test to see if something is a limestone, for instance, we have this chalk. The chalk looks virtually identical to siltstone. Very, very close. The way to identify it, though, is to put a drop of acid on it, and you'll see that the chalk fizzes and bubbles up. And so we know it's having a reaction with the calcite. So all of the limestones, all the different types, whether it's coquina, oolitic limestone, fossiliferous limestone, or micrite limestone, or chalk limestone, all of them will react to diluted acid. I am using a 10% hydrochloric acid. You can also use lemon juice or any other very mild acid like that. And you'll get that bubbling reaction. So the oolitic limestone and the coquina form on the beach. The fossiliferous limestone is that limestone which you can see the remains of organisms. So you might see seashells in it, you might see a starfish or sea urchin, uh, a crinoid, a trilobite, brachiopods. These are all animals that we're going to talk about during the semester. But they will be embedded in the rock. Well, where is the environment deposition for fossiliferous limestone? Well, think about where do most animals in the ocean live? The vast majority of all organisms in the ocean live on the continental shelf. So that means from close to the beach all the way to the edge of the continental shelf. Once you go deep down into the ocean, then much, much fewer organisms are alive in those areas because organisms do need sunlight. They need plants. A lot of the fish and other organisms live off of plants that live in the shallower marine areas. And so they rely on those plants for habitat, for food, and so they're going to be found in the continental shelves. So when you see fossiliferous limestone, you know it's going to be kind of a shallow to continental shelf marine area. And then the last one is micrite limestone. This will not have any fossils in it at all. It is limestone. It's going to react to the hydrochloric acid. This can form anywhere from shallow to deep, deep marine. So this has a range. Um, but you will not see any fossils in it. So that is the group of limestones. Now the other rocks that we have that are formed from biologic materials all form from plant materials. So we have coal. And these are actually two different types of coal. For this class, you just need to know coal. You don't need to differentiate between the types of coal. So we have bituminous coal and anthracite coal. And coal is formed from a lot of plant materials. The key is that it takes 15 feet of plant material to make one foot of coal. It's compressed down very, very, very tightly. Now, in order for us to get that volume of plant material, what would the climate and the temperatures be like? Where do plants grow most prolifically? Is it in you know, the Arctic Circle in Antarctica? Do we have a lot of plants here? No. Is it near the equator where it's warm and tropical and rains every single day? Yes. So when you have big, thick seams of coal, which we find all across the United States and in other continents also, we know that this coal formed when the climate was much, much warmer and that plants just grew prolifically. They, they were extremely abundant, and actually carbon dioxide was much, much, much higher than it was today. 
And as a result, we have very thick seams of coal all around the world. These seams of coal can, can range up to 300 feet thick. So imagine the amount of plant material that it took to make that amount of coal. And so because this is plant material, we're, we're talking about terrestrial plant material, we know that the coal that formed had to form in warm tropical areas with a lot of rainfall, but also they formed in swampy areas. So these would have been um, shallow swampy areas, maybe near the edge of some seas, um, and the plants fell into the water and got preserved over time. Another plant material that gets preserved is amber. Now what's neat about amber is that a lot of times you can smell the, the, the plant material. So amber comes from tree sap. It's just petrified tree sap. And so basically it's the same thing if you have maple syrup on your pancakes. Maple syrup is also tree sap. Well, if you fossilize that maple syrup, it's going to become amber. But a lot of times you can actually smell the plant, if you have a sample of amber. And amber is typically kind of a golden color. It can also be almost white in color, too. We find a lot of amber um, comes from the Baltic region, um, over towards Russia. And this also forms in swamps. So what would happen is, is that we probably could also guess even the season of the year when this formed. Because when does the greatest amount of sap rise up in a tree? Well, it rises up in the early spring. That sap is moving up into the tree, and it's going to be nourishing all the branches and the leaves that are going to come out. So you have the greatest amount of sap rising in the spring. Well, what if you have a storm come along, and it knocks the tree over as that sap is rising. That tree falls into a nearby pond or stream or river and it sinks to the bottom, that sap is gonna be preserved as amber. So amber, as well as the coal, that environmental deposition is swamp. And then the very last group of sedimentary rocks that we'll talk about are those which are chemically formed. So these typically form from either evaporation or from mineral replacement. So we have this group of rocks. The first group is chert, and we're actually going to see chert um, as a mineral replacement in a lot of fossils. So in this case, chert is um, quartz that's been dissolved in water. You can often find this in rivers and streams. If there's abundant quartz in the area, small amounts of it will be completely dissolved in the water. And if you have any organic material, for instance, this is part of an old tree log. If you have organic material that's fallen into the water, what happens is, atom by atom, that chert is going to replace the organic matter, or the quartz is going to replace the organic matter, and it's going to form chert. Chert can also form in the very deepest parts of the ocean, too. So it's either going to be terrestrial in a river or stream, as in for petrified wood, or it's going to be in deep marine areas. The other mineral you should know, because it's the major component in limestone, is calcite. And of course, calcite is a mineral that makes limestone fizz. So calcite does form in areas of evaporation. Typically what happens is, you can see it busy. What happens is you're gonna have a lagoon or a pond near an ocean. And you'll have seawater come in due to a storm. And then that water's gonna evaporate over time. And what's gonna happen is that the seawater is gonna stratify into different mineral compositions. So the minerals are gonna become super saturated and kind of separate by layer. So calcite can be one of those layers. We can also have a layer of gypsum. In this case, this is selenite gypsum. And then another common layer is rock salt. So this is halite. Again, you can lick halite. This is the same thing that's on your table in the salt shaker. This particular rock salt has not been purified. So it's this gray color because it contains all the natural minerals that are in seawater. Um, I personally would not use Himalayan sea salt because that is actually formed 
Um, it's formed in the Himalayan mountains and it was formed from a basin. All salt on the planet originated in the oceans. But what happened in that particular case is you had a layer of salt and then you had a volcano erupt with basalt flowing on top of it. Well, igneous rocks frequently contain radioactive minerals. And if you look up Himalayan sea salt and radioactive minerals, just Google that and you can make your decision on whether you really want to eat that Himalayan salt. So that's our group of, min of rocks that we're going to be looking at throughout this class. Again, you're going to need to know the full name of the rock. So Arco sandstone, black shale, red shale, you need to use a full descriptor. Fossiliferous limestone, oolitic limestone, chalk limestone. You need to know those names, memorize them. You also need to know the environments of deposition. Because when we see a conglomerate and we find a T-Rex skeleton next to it, you need to be able to describe to me where, what was that T-Rex doing that he is preserved next to this conglomerate. Well, conglomerates were in rivers and streams. Why would a T-Rex be there? Well, he went to get a drink of water. Something happened that he died and he fell into the stream and was preserved. But we know it was a river and that's where the T-Rex was preserved. So that's a very quick review on sedimentary rocks and their environments of deposition. Um, you do have a couple of extra rocks on your list. Um, you have the igneous rocks of granite and basalt, and those are just foundational rocks, as are the metamorphic rocks that were listed, which are schist and gneiss. Um, basically, I just want you to have an idea about the igneous and metamorphic rocks, because we're going to look at diagrams that show a foundation uh, that are lowest in the rock column of either igneous or metamorphic rocks, and then on top of those, we'll see sedimentary rocks that are formed on top of those. So these are the rocks that you'll see in this class. Um, know the rocks and know the environments of deposition, and just let me know if you have any questions at all.